Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Brian Shapiro, a scientific content specialist at ATCC. Thank you for joining us for the latest installment in the ATCC Excellence in Research webinar series. It's entitled Luciferase Reporter Cancer Cell Lines, Facilitate Your CAR-T Development, presented by Mr. John Folk. Mr. Folk is a lead biologist in research and development at ATCC. In this presentation, Mr. Folk will present new luciferase reporter tumor cell lines that naturally express high levels of clinically relevant CAR-T target antigens on the cell surface, such as CD19, CD20, and HER2. He will then show how these versatile reporter lines can be utilized to examine the function of CAR T cells. If you have any questions for our speaker, please use the chat function available through the webinar program. All questions will be answered as time allows at the end of the presentation. The recorded webinar presentation will be archived on the ATCC website, www atcc.org. So with that, I'd like to welcome John Folk. Thank you for the introduction, Brian. Founded in 1925, ATCC is a nonprofit organization with headquarters in Manassas, Virginia, and an R&D and services center in Gaithersburg, Maryland. ATCC is an innovative R&D company featuring advanced cell models and immune oncology tools. Today in this webinar, we will discuss an introduction to amino oncology. Then we will proceed to the ATCC luciferase reporter cell line generation. We will follow with ATCC application data, and we will finish with a summary. Overall, we have five major categories of cancer immunotherapy. These include oncolytic virus therapies, cancer vaccines, cytokine therapies, adoptive cell transfer, and immune checkpoint inhibitors. We have examples of each therapy. For oncolytic virus, there is thalmagene for melanoma. For cancer vaccines, there is BCG. For cytokine therapies, there is interferon alpha and IL-2. For adoptive cell transfer, there is CD19 CAR-T. And for immune cell checkpoint inhibitors, there is CTLA-4 and PD-1 inhibitors. Today, we will focus on research tools that we have designed for category four, the adoptive cell transfer. This slide shows the timeline of CAR T cell therapy development and progress. In 1993, the first generation of CAR T cells were developed. By 2011, the fourth generation of CAR T cells had been developed. In 2017, the first CD19 CAR T cell technology was approved by the FDA. Over 300 CAR T cell trials were registered as of 2018. Considerable research efforts has been invested into developing new CAR T structures to increase the scope of targeted cancer types and raise their anti-tumor efficacy. One of the bottlenecks in the process of CAR-T development is evaluating the biofunction of CAR-T cells. Four of the most commonly used assays to investigate cell-mediated cytotoxicity include the chromium CR51 release assay, the luciferase-mediated bioluminescent imaging assay, the impedance-based assay, and the flow cytometry assay. The chromium release assay is an assay in which chromium-51 is released from labeled target cells co-cultured with target-specific effector cells, which are shown in red, or control cells shown in blue, at different effector-to-target ratios determined relative to a maximum and a spontaneous chromium-51 control. For the bioluminescence assay, the bioluminescence intensity 
is proportional to the number of viable luciferase expressing target cells. This is indicative of the effector mediated cytotoxicity as different effector to target ratios. For the impedance based assay, detachment of adherent target cells is monitored by decrease in normalized cell index upon the addition of target specific effector cells shown in red or control cells shown in blue at a specific effector to target ratio and defined time after seeding, which is represented by the dotted line. The purple represents untreated target cells and the green curve represents target cells treated with a lysis control. On the right side is the flow cytometry assay in which seven AAD and an exon five staining of target cells undergoing effector cell mediated apoptosis and cell death. Live cells are seen in the lower left quadrant. Early apoptotic cells are seen in the lower right quadrant and cells in the eternal stages of apoptosis and cell death are shown in the upper right quadrant. Measuring CAR T cytotoxicity is an in vitro process in which, which typically involves a series of labor intensive co culture experiments and amino assays, where reproducibility remains a challenge during the evaluation of new CAR T cells due to donor to donor variation and other possible factors. In addition to reproducibility being an issue, the validation assays themselves can be problematic. For example, the use of radioactive chromium release assay has a major drawback. Data can only be acquired at a single time point. Moreover, reagent half-life and protective measures and waste disposal are critical factors because of the assay's intrinsic radioactivity. Non-radioactive assays for CAR-T function evaluation are available although these require a time-consuming labeling step and suffer from intra or inter-assay variability stemming from inconsistent dioptake or spontaneous dye leakage over the course of the assay. A method of studying CAR-T effector function that eliminates the concerns of chromium-51 release or dye loading assay is the bioluminescence reporter assay. In the in the bioluminescence reporter assay, target cells that constitutively express luciferase are co-cultured with candidate effector cells and cytotoxicity is monitored via the loss of bioluminescence signal. In addition to their ease of use, the luciferase expressing target cells in bioluminescence assay can, can improve inter-experimental reproducibility. To provide target cells for immuno-oncology researchers adopting bioluminescent assays, we have generated five luciferase reporter tumor cell lines that can be used to examine the function of CAR-T cells. These reporter cell lines naturally express high levels of CAR-T target antigens on their cell surface. We have previously generated around 30 luciferase expressing cell lines. We performed a cancer cell line encyclopedia CCLD database search for 16 of the luciferase reporter cell lines and our five new cell lines for common hematological tumor CAR targets. A cancer cell line encyclopedia database contains mRNA expression data on 10,019 cell lines. We then generated a heat map in which genes could be colored in red indicating high expression or blue indicating low expression. Most of, most of those luciferase expressing cell lines express high levels of, of SDC1. Our new CAR target cells, RAJILUK2, FRAJILUK2, and DADILUK2 also express high levels of CD22 and CD38 in addition to CD19 and CD20. 
you will notice that Will2S is absent from this list. This is because this cell line was unavailable to the Broad Institute when this database was generated. We are in the process of sequencing the RNA from it, and this data will be available in a few months. A similar search was conducted to compare the RNA expression of common solid tumor CAR targets. BT474 expresses high levels of HER2. This data was used to determine which, luc which luciferase cell lines would be a good candidate for use in studies of various solid tumor CAR targets, such as MET, CD70, and EPCAM, among others. Uh, in the next several slides, we will discuss the ATCC CAR T reporter cell line generation. We have generated five ATCC CAR T target luciferous reporter cell lines. Will 2 S Luke 2 and Raji Luke 2, which are shown on the left side of this figure, naturally express high levels of CD19 and can be targeted by CD19 CAR T cells. Dowdy Luke 2 cells and Farage Luke 2 cells, which are shown in the central portion of this figure, naturally express high levels of CD20 and can be targeted by CD20 CAR T cells. BT474 Luke 2 naturally expresses high levels of HER2 and can be targeted by HER2 CAR T cells. In this slide, we discuss the generation of CAR T luciferase reporter cell lines. A lentiviral plasmid was virally transduced into HECC authenticated tumor cell lines. The culture was selectively isolated using blastocytin. Single cell cloning was used to generate a homogeneous culture, which was expanded and validated for luciferase expression. The clones were characterized using cell morphology and growth kinetics. On the bottom portion of this slide, we show that uh, the how luciferase is used in a cat it used to catalyze the reaction of luciferin and oxygen to produce oxidized luciferin and light. The light signal is read by a luminometer or a CCD camera in either a lytic or a live cell assay. To characterize the CAR-T target cell lines, we compare the morphology of the CAR-T luciferous portal cell lines with this parental cell line and found all to have similar morphology to their parental cell line. We then compared the growth kinetics of the five CAR T luciferous reporter cell lines with this parental cell line and found them each to have a similar growth kinetics to the parental cell line. In these figures, you can see the parental cell line is shown in black and the CAR T luciferous reporter cell line is shown in green. In this experiment, the luciferase activity was analyzed using various cell numbers, 80, 500, 2000, and 10,000. The luciferase activity was shown to have a linear correlation between bioluminescence intensity and cell number. We performed bioluminescence assay for over 30 population doublings and found that the luciferase expression was stable during that time. Fax analysis was performed on CAR T target luciferase reporter cell lines after 30 population doublings to show that the antigen expression is stable. On the left side of this figure, we see that Raji Luke 2 in the upper left panel and Will 2S Luke 2 in the lower left panel each have high expression of CD19 as depicted in red, which is compared to the isotype control shown in blue. In the central panel of this figure, we can see that Farage Look 2 and Daddy Look 2 each have high expression of CD20 as shown in red as compared to the isotope control shown in blue. In the panel on the right, we can see that BT474 Look 2 has high expression of HER2 shown in red 
as compared to the isotope control shown in blue. In the next several slides, we will explore the use of our newly generated CAR-T luciferase reporter cell lines in studying the cytotoxic effects of antigen-specific CAR-T cells. We have identified commercially available CAR-T cells which specifically target CD19, CD20, or HER2. Each specific CAR-T was paired with a mock CAR-T cell generated from the same donor. This allows us to compare mock CAR-T cells and the target-specific CAR-T cells in the same genetic background. Different donors could have different nonspecific killing activity. Mock CAR-T cells were generated to target mock single chain variable fragments. In this series of experiments, we used our newly generated CAR-T luciferase reporters to study CD19 cytotoxicity. On the left side of the slide, we display the bioluminescent data from CD19 positive RAGILUC2 cells or WOL2SLUC2 cells, which were used as target cells for either CD19 CAR-T cells shown in blue or mock CAR-T cells shown in gray at various ratios of CAR T cells to, to target cells at ratios of 1 to 1, 2 to 1, 5 to 1, and 10 to 1. After 24 hours of co culture, cell killing was measured using a luminescence assay. In this assay, as cell death increases, the luminescence signal decreases. When the luminescence signal was normalized to the wells which contained no CAR T cells, the dose dependent antigen specific targeting of CD19 CAR T cells shown in blue becomes evident. The cytotoxic effect of CD19 CAR T cells is found to be significantly greater than the nonspecific cell killing seen when cells are co-cultured with mock CAR T cells as shown in gray. And in these two graphs and in future graphs, the asterisk indicates significant difference and NS equals not significant using an unpaired t-test. On the right portion of this figure, we used a secondary method to measure CD19 CAR T cell cytotoxicity. RAGILUC2 cells were stained with vibrant DIO dye and real-time fluorescent imaging was captured every 30 minutes for 24 hours during the co-culture with CAR T effector cells. In figure C, in the upper panel, two stained RAGILUC2 cells from the co-culture experiment were tracked for six hours. In the upper portion of the panel, RAGILUC2 cells were co-cultured with mock CAR T cells. And even though the cells become surrounded by the mock CAR T cells, a decrease in green fluorescence is not seen. In the lower panel, we see RAGILUC2 cells become surrounded by CD19 CAR T cells and a decrease in fluorescent signal is seen over time. In figure D, at the bottom right, we compare the fluorescence at different time points using a two by two mosaic captured with a forex objective to show what is happening on a larger scale within the well. After 24 hours, is compared with six hours when co-culturing RAGILUC2 cells with mock, two, with mock CAR T cells, a large number of green fluorescent cells are still present after 24 hours. However, when the 24 hour image is compared to the six hour image in which RAGILUC2 cells were co-cultured with CD19 CAR T cells, a decrease in green fluorescence is seen. We were able to generate two videos by stitching together the captured images 
In the first video, rodular two cells were co-cultured with mock CAR T cells, a decrease in green fluorescence intensity is not seen even though the cells become surrounded by mock CAR T cells. In the second video on the right, rodular two cells become surrounded by CD19 CAR T cells and the green fluorescence signal decreases over time. After studying CD19 cytotoxicity, we then studied HER2 CAR T cytotoxicity using the BT474 LUC2 reporter cell line. In this figure on the left, HER2 positive BT474 LUC2 cells were used as target cells for either HER2 CAR T shown in blue or MOC CAR T shown in gray which were seeded at the same effector to target ratios as previously mentioned. After 24 hours of co-culture, cell killing was measured using a luminescence assay and HER2 cells clearly show a dose-dependent specific killing effect, which is greater than non-specific killing observed with mock CAR T cells. On the right side of this figure, a secondary method was used to study HER2 CAR T cytotoxicity. HER2 CAR T cells were used to target the HER2 positive BT474 LUC2 cells, a 10 to 1 ratio, and the cell killing was measured using the Excelligent system, as shown in purple, to measure a decrease in impedance over time. Mock CAR T cells from the same donor were measured in a, as a control, as shown in, gr in green, do not cause a dramatic decrease in cell impedance. The black curve indicates BT474 LUC2 cells grown without CAR T cells. In the next two slides, we will explore CD20 CAR T cell cytotoxicity as studied using Daddy Luc 2 and Farage Luc 2 luciferase reporter cell lines. In the figure on the left, CD20 positive Daddy Luc 2 cells were used as target cells for either CD20 shown in blue or mock CAR T cells shown in gray, which were seeded at the same effector to target ratios as previously mentioned. After 24 hours of co-culture, the luminescence assay was performed and CD20 CAR T cells were determined to have a dose-dependent specific killing, which is greater than the non-specific cell killing observed with mock CAR T cells. On the right side of this figure, we used a live cell imaging as a secondary method to study CD20 CAR T cytotoxicity. Daddy Luc2 cells were co-cultured with CD20 CAR T cells or mock CAR T cells in the presence of the incusite cytotox red dye in the medium, and real-time fluorescence imaging was captured every hour for 24 hours. The cytotox red dye enters dead cells, so as more cells die in the assay, then the red fluorescence intensity observed in the images will also increase. In the upper panel of figure B, Daddy Luc2 cells were co-cultured with mock CAR T cells. We notice a small increase in red fluorescent uh, dead cells is observed, indicating nonspecific cell killing. When Daddy Luc2 cells are co-cultured with CD20 CAR T cells, as shown in the lower right panel, on the lower panel of figure B, a greater increase in red fluorescent dead cells is seen as compared to the mock CAR T cells treated with treated Daddy Luc2 cells, indicating specific CAR T cytotoxicity. In figure C on the bottom right, we compare the fluorescence at different effector to target ratios using a two by two mosaic captured with a forex objective to show what's happening on a larger scale within the cell. 
a larger number of red fluorescent cells is observed in wells co-cultured with CD20 CAR T cells, both at a 5 to 1 and a 10 to 1 ratio as compared to N cells or co-cultured with mock CAR T cells at the same ratios. In, in the graph in figure D, the clustered red fluorescence was quantified and shown to have a dose-dependent effect of CD20 CAR T cells shown red, which is greater than nonspecific killing observed with mock CAR T cells shown in gray. In this slide, we were able to stitch together the images captured for 24 hours into a video. In the first video, Daddy Look 2 cells were co cultured with mock CAR T cells. You'll notice that there's a small increase in red fluorescence indicating nonspecific cell killing, cell killing. In the second video on the right, Daddy Look 2 cells were co cultured with C20 CAR T cells. We see a greater increase in dead cells indicating a higher level of specific cell killing. CD20 CAR T cytotoxicity was studied using Farage LUC2 cells. On the left side of this figure, CD20 positive Farage LUC2 cells were used as target cells for either CD20 CAR T shown in blue or mock CAR T shown in gray, which were seeded at the same ratios of effector to target cells as previously mentioned. After 24 hours of co culture, the luminescence assay was performed and determined to have a dose dependent specific killing with CD20 CAR T cells, which was greater than the non specific killing observed with mock CAR T cells. On the right side of this figure, we used live cell imaging as a secondary method to study CD20 CAR T cytotoxicity. Froslerk 2 cells were co cultured with. CD20 CAR T cells or mock CAR T cells in the presence of incusite cytotox red dye in the medium and real-time fluorescence imaging was captured every hour for 24 hours, resulting in an increase in fluorescence intensity when co-cultured with CD20 CAR T cells as compared to co-cultures with mock CAR T cells. In figure C on the bottom right, we compare the fluorescence at different effector to target ratios using a two by two mosaic captured with a forex objective to show what is happening at 24 hours of co-culture in a larger scale within the well. A larger number of red fluorescent or dead cells is observed in wells co-cultured with CD20 CAR T cells both at a 5 to 1 and 10 to 1 ratio as compared to when cells are co-cultured with mock CAR T cells at the same ratios. In figure D, the clustered red fluorescence was quantified and shown to have a dose-dependent effect when Farage LUC2 cells were co-cultured with CD20 CAR T cells versus mock CAR T cells shown in gray. We were able to stitch together the, imaged, the images gathered over 24 hours into a video. In the first video, Farage LUC2 cells are co-cultured with mock CAR T cells. You'll notice that there is an increase in red fluorescence indicating nonspecific cell killing. In the second video on the right, Frosler 2 cells were co cultured with CD20 CAR T cells. We see a greater increase in dead cells, indicating a high level of specific cell killing. And this leads us to our, uh, to our summary. The CAR T target luciferase reporter cell lines described in this webinar provide an advantage in measuring target cell killing without the use of radioactive chromium release assay or pre-labeling the cells with 
or CAR-T functional evaluation. In addition, these, cell, these reporter cell lines were characterized and authenticated using cell morphology, growth kinetics, and STR analysis. The expression stability of both the target antigen and luciferase was verified using high passage reporter cells. Importantly, the cytotoxicity in the, in the CAR-T target luciferase reporter cell line could be measured by the loss of bioluminescent signal. And this loss was confirmed by live cell imaging and cytotoxic dye uptake assays. In summary, the well-characterized CAR-T luciferase reporter cell lines enable convenient and consistent signal quantification. They're easy to use tools for studying CAR-T biofunction and validating new CAR-T agents for cancer immunotherapy. These robust cell models are representative of the most predominant patient-derived carcinoma and lymphoma cancer cell lines used in oncology research. The CAR-T target luciferase reporter cell lines were selected from ATCC's extensive catalog of established cancer cell lines that contain high endogenous expression of some of the most prevalent cancer antigens, which makes them more physiologically relevant as in vitro tools to develop adoptive cancer uh, adoptive CAR T cell therapies. Uh, thank you. For more information, please visit www.atcc.org forward slash immunooncology. Thank you. Well, thank you, John. In just a few moments, we will begin our Q&A session. Please use the chat function available through the webinar program to submit your questions. The recorded webinar presentation and a PDF of the presentation will be available on demand on the ATCC website at www.atcc.org. Let's go ahead and jump in. Um, let's see, the first question that's come in is around the culture conditions that, that you use during the CAR-T killing assays. So, so what were they? Were they the same for all of the cells? Did, were they different from for the different cells? Um, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. That's a very good question. And all of these cells were cultured uh, using the ATCC cell culture SOP conditions for each cell line, as listed on the ATCC website. But we did remove plasticidin from the media prior to performing any co-culture assays. The CAR T cells were initially cultured in their preferred media, but they were switched over to the ATCC media without blastocytin and performed the co-culture assay. Okay, good, good. Now, um, this next question is around the protein profiling data that you showed. Um, can you uh, tell the asker how they can get that data? Oh, that's an excellent question. Uh, to get the data, I would say please go to the ATCC product website for each cell line, and you'll find a relevant information under the section of characteristics. And if there's any further information that's not there, you can contact customer support directly and they will forward the questions to us at you know, R&D. Right, and, and um, the other data that you showed um, is available as an application note, right? Um, where, where would that one be able to find that? That's correct, the application note is available on the ATC2 website. Right, under uh, actually splash um, reference uh, uh, resources, sorry, and then um, under application note. That's so, uh, okay. all right. Um, now, um, this is uh, an interesting question um, that I kind of had. Uh, where did you get the mock and antigen tar CAR T cells from? Well, they, uh, they came from a commercial source, and uh, we found them from a company called Promeb. 
Okay. Good. Good. Um. All right. Now, uh, this next question is around passaging. Can you can you talk about the passage number that you use? For the target cells, um, or or for the effector cells. Of course, that's a that's a great question. For the target cells, we use a lower passage cell that would be similar to the passage number that you, as the customer, would be using in your laboratory when you work with these cell lines. For the effector cells, uh, we also use low passage cells. The uh, the CAR T cells are primary cells. And so we use them within three days of sawing. We give them a period to recover after a saw. But because they're primary cells, we didn't want to leave them in culture too long. But we did see that they were able to proliferate for several, uh, for a couple of weeks, and then they did retain their CAR-T functionality. All right, good, good. Now, how would you um, order the cells if, if someone were to be interested in purchasing them? Uh, the cell lines can be ordered through the ATCC website. Right, right, and um, and actually, as as shown um, on this slide, uh, you can go to www.atcc.org/immuno-oncology, and um, there's a link there to where the cells live. All right. Um, Ah, now, this is a kind of an interesting question, um, John, and, and you can answer it any way that you like. Uh, what challenges did you find while, um, you know, developing the cells, developing the experimental tests that you uh, showed today? Oh, well, that's a great question, Brian. The, the real-time analysis assay using Excelligence, uh, we found that that works great for adherent cultures but it's much more difficult to use with suspension cultures uh, when the cultures when the cultures first need to be tethered onto the plate. We worked with that and uh, had great difficulty figuring that out. And so we used it for the adherent cultures. For the suspension cultures, we then used the dye uptake assays. And um, those have challenges as well. It took us time to find the right dye and also the right protocols to work with the dye. The dyes have a ten the, the green dye that we use, the DIO, vibrant dye, has a tendency to float in the media and it needs to be pre-mixed well prior to use. Uh, this can lead to inconsistent staining of the cells. We also found that the dye is hard on the cells and that they do better after 24 hour recovery period prior to setting up the experiment. And some dyes also have photo bleaching, photo bleaching issues. And for the bioluminescent assay, bioluminescent assay, we actually found that one to be the most uh, uh, easy to set up. Set up was straightforward. We were able to seed the cells, the required densities, and then perform the assay 24 hours later. Okay, I like it. I like it. Uh, now. How did you determine the correct ratio of dyes to add for, for data collection? Well, as, as with most, most dyes, the first place we go to is the uh, manufacturer and their SOPs. And in their product sheets, they recommend a certain range of dye concentration. And then we tried the different dye concentrations, and we needed to run preliminary staining studies uh, to find the right dye ratio. Okay. All right. Um, this next question is a, a little bit loaded, but we can um, we can take a shot at it. Uh, everyone has flow, as in flow cytometry. Why wouldn't you use that? Well, um, this assay requires uh, the cells to be stained with two different antibodies, and you can have uh, inconsistent cell staining. And because you're staining these cells with two different antibodies, uh, the antibodies can't tell the difference between your CAR T cells, which you know, are primary and could be dying in the, in the assay as well, and the, uh, between the CAR T cells or your um, our target cells. 
Okay. Um, and now someone made the comments about the uh, Wills 2S data that you showed in the slide 10 and 11. That's that's around the Broad Institute CCLE data. Um, you you didn't show um, that data. Why didn't you show that? But you showed it for all the other um, cells. Well, the uh, the Will 2S is an ATCC internal cell line that the Broad Institute uh, didn't have access to, and they didn't include it in their database. But we are currently working on sequencing the RNA from that cell line, and once we get the full sequence data for Will 2S in a couple of months, we'll make that available either through publication or through the website. Okay, I like it. Um, and all right, so um, all of the, not all of them, but, but the, um, the cell lines, Raji, Wills, Tu, Farage, and Dowdy, um, they can be used for the CAR targets that you talked about, the CAR T targets, sorry. Um, what other targets could they be used for, do, do you think, right? We didn't actually test these, but what, what other targets could, could be potentially interrogated? Well, from the uh, CCLA database uh, study, uh, we believe that Raji would be, Luke 2 would be a good target for BCMA, uh, CD20, CD22, CD38, CMET, C70, among others. For the BT474, Luke 2 uh, could be used for common targets such as CD138, CMET, EPCAM, MUC1, ESCA, et cetera. Uh, for the fraud, uh, those could be used to as targets for CD19, CD22, CD38, CD70, EDL1, among others. And then for the Daddy Loop 2, we believe those could be used for DCMA, CD19, CD22, CD38, and CD70, as well as EGFR, HER2, and MUC16. Nice, nice. Very, very complete answer there. So, okay, for, um, well, we've got, we have a bunch of questions that come in. Um, the next one, um, for the live cell imaging assay, when you mention green fluorescence, are you talking about bioluminescence, or um, are you actually talking about the dye assay? Well, for the green fluorescence, we're actually talking about the dye assay. And in this assay, we pre-labeled Raji Luke 2 cells with the DIO dye that has an excitation and emission wavelength that can be detected on a microscope system that is capable of detecting green fluorescence. Okay, good, good. Um, now, are the LUC2 reporter cells clone cells? Um, and if so, do you know how many copies of LUC2 um, were integrated in each cell? That's an excellent question. The LUC2 clones are clonal. We use single cell cloning. And we did not determine the copy number of LUC2 within the cells. We did evaluate the, the clones for the intensity of the luminescence signal produced and the stability of the uh, luminescence over time. Okay, I like it. And um, what was the Mach CAR T cell that you used? I guess I guess yeah. you explained where you got them from already, but you could. Could you describe a little bit more what the um, mock car cells are with regards to antigen, for example? Of course, the uh, the mock car T cell uh, was designed to target a mock single chain variable fragment. Okay, so um, basically, would it um, aside from non-specific uh, activity, then would you you wouldn't imagine there to be really much activity at at all, right? Above baseline. Um, that, 
That's correct. But these these right. cell lines are coming from a uh, coming from a different individual than the cancer cells. So there could be some uh, some non-specific killing of the T cells. All right. Nice. Nice. Good. Uh, good explanation for that. Now, um, let's see. Um, so I'm not sure what the answer to this question. Do you have any of the normal and breast cancer cell lines expressing stable luciferase? Uh, I believe that we have several other uh, breast cancer cell lines that express luciferase. At this time, we do not have any uh, normal cells which express luciferase. Yeah, that's right. That's in um, our, our other luciferase expressing cell line line of products, right? Um, and correct. you can actually you can actually find those uh, on our website if you go to www.atccc.org/luciferase. That will take you right there to a list of those products that that you can purchase if you find the cell that you need. And um, uh, this question you addressed earlier, which media was used for co-culture? Well, uh, in working with the cell lines, uh, most of them use the same media. Most of them use with, with different amounts of blastocytin, but the base media would be the same. Most of them use RPMI 1640 plus 10% FBS. The... Um, BT-474 cell line uses the hybrid care media plus 10% FPS, both of which right, are available right. from HCC. Uh, good point, good point. Yeah, the RPMI is for all the cells that um, that are in suspension culture, right? That's correct. Gotcha. All right, um, let's see. How long do these CAR T survive? I guess the question they're directed that at directing that towards the um the target cell. Or the So how okay. long how long can the target cell live in culture? How many passages have you taken it out to? Well for the um uh we only let the co culture go for twenty four hours before we uh, measure the cytotoxicity assay. And at that time, we were able to definitely see a decrease in bioluminescence. But for if the question was regarding maintaining the CAR T cells in culture, uh, we kept those for several weeks in culture. Okay. Good, good. Uh, and the next question I'll go ahead and take and, and give you a break, John. Um, can we get the presentation uh, recording? And of course, it will be on uh, our website, uh, www.atcc.org um, slash webinars. And if you navigate to um, 2022, uh, it will be towards the top. Uh, uh, just click on that, and um, there's a, uh, a, a presentation viewer. Uh, um, MP4 viewer, rather, window, you just click on and you can watch the video. All right. Uh, how did you optimize the CAR T to target cell ratio? Uh, you might have addressed this earlier, but um, uh, I guess we can take a stab at that again. And is uh, the ratio the, oh. is assay time window? Sorry, is it um, dependent oh. on the particular CAR T? and or target cell? Uh, so we went to, uh, in deciding uh, which ratios to use, we uh, looked at different literature that's out there. And so we used uh, a similar ratios that we found in the literature. Those would be 0, 1 to 1, 2 to 1, 5 to 1, and 10 to 1 ratios. And we used the same ratio for each cell line tested each of our target cells. Okay. Um, and then this is the last question that we have so far come in. Um, how can we freeze the cells and what's the efficacy? Oh, 
sorry, how long can we freeze the cells for? And generally, what's the recovery of the frozen reporter cells? So we have found that our our recovery is actually very good for these cells when they're frozen, according to the uh, using a either controlled rate freezer or a uh, or a ATC2 cool cell. Uh, we found that the cells had 90% or above covering. Okay, oh, that's an excellent recovery rate. Um, okay, well, that's all the questions that have come in. At this time, we will conclude our Q&A session. I'd like to thank John for the excellent presentation, and thank you, everyone, for attending the webinar. Uh, Please join us for more webinars in the ATCC Excellence in Research webinar series. On November 2nd, uh, Dr. Kevin Tayo will give his talk on Does Differentiation Matter? Comparing the Toxicological Response Between Airway Epithelial Models. Thank you again, everyone, and have a great day. Thank you.